I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker. We are very fortunate to have with us Dr. David Morris. He's a prolific writer, a speaker, and an advocate who has provided an extraordinary array of path-breaking policy initiatives. He's also the co-founder of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which is an organization that focuses on innovative strategies, working models, and timely information to support environmentally sound and equitable community development. In terms of his authorship, he has five nonfiction books with quite an array of topics, ranging from the analysis of the Chilean development to the future of electric power to the transformations of cities and neighborhoods has columns in many top publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, International Herald Tribune, and the Smithsonian Magazine, just to name a few. He's also been a consultant at the local, state, and federal levels. He has served as an advisor and a consultant to the energy departments of Presidents Ford, Carter, Clinton, and George Bush. So today, he's here to talk to us about the rules of sustainability. He'll do his presentation, and when he concludes his presentation, there'll be time for question and answer. So please help me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. David Morris. Thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, and, uh, and an honor uh, to be invited here to, to speak especially about a topic that is so near and dear to, uh, to my own heart, uh, in deference to, to where I'm speaking and, and the sports fans in the audience, I, I left out of my bio that I graduated from Cornell. <laughs> my, my charge this morning uh, is to present a context for the local specific uh, action-oriented and content-rich discussions that you're going to be having in the next day and a half. When I was preparing for this talk, I was reminded of, a, of an insight uh, by the French poet and philosopher, uh, Marcel Proust. The voyage of discovery, he said, lies not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And I think that, in essence, this conference is about seeing our communities and our surroundings with new eyes. The word sustainability is almost always used in an environmental context, but we, we forget sometimes how environmentalism itself has evolved over the years. At the turn of the 20th century, the modern environmental movement was born. It focused on preservation, and its legacy is the national parks. A half century later, the environmental movement widened its scope and began to focus on materials that were toxic uh, to human beings, uh, PCBs, lead, mercury. And the great legacies of that era of environmentalism are the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and the environmental protection agencies at the federal and at the state level. And then in the late 1980s and the 1990s, the movement widened its lens once again to regulate materials which undermine ecosystems. And the biggest development, the biggest issue, as we know, is climate change. And there's a reason that climate change and global warming has elicited such a vigorous and, I might say, vicious uh, opposition. The reason is that, from an environmental perspective now, we are, in essence, saying and declaring that we must change the materials foundation of industrial society. The fight against global warming embodies and illustrates two fundamental laws of environmentalism. One, there is no free lunch. And number two, everything is connected to everything else. When we see with new eyes, it means to understand and to tackle the central design flaw of modern economies, which is separation. We've built a modern society in which we've separated the worker from the workplace, the power plant from the appliance, the farmer from the kitchen, the manufacturer from the customer, the banker uh, from the, uh, from the, cust from the uh, borrower. Uh, and ultimately, as we, I think, increasingly understand, the citizen from the government. We've created a system in which those who make the decisions are separate from those who feel the impact 
of those decisions. And then adding insult to injury, we tweaked the system a little bit so that we separated those who benefit from decisions from those who feel their costs. We've separated authority from responsibility. And the result is poor decision making and sometimes catastrophic decision making. We did this all willfully and we did this consciously. There was no conspiracy involved in it. We did it because we felt that it was necessary and for many that it was a historical inevitability. The outcome of the technological revolutions that we were experiencing in the 19th and the 20th century. And there's some justification in that. When steel replaced wood, big manufacturing replaced small manufacturing. When concentrated energy sources like fossil fuels replaced diffuse uh, energy sources uh, like uh, wind turbines and water power that humanity had used for millennia, we went from small and dispersed to centralized and big. We replaced batch production, that is producing small amounts of quantities on a, uh, on a, uh, a discrete process, to mass manufacturing. Railroads and then cars replaced the horse and the buggy, and markets expanded geometrically. Commerce overflowed boundaries and became a national and then an international affair. And we designed rules that fit that technological development, that technological state of affairs. State legislatures, for example, in the 1920s, granted private companies, electric utilities, but private companies, the governmental authority, that is an authority that only governments uh, had previously had, to seize private property, to build high voltage transmission lines because bigger power plants generate electricity much cheaper than smaller power plants, and bigger power plants tended to be further away from their customers, uh, and so it was, it was uh, in the society's interest uh, to build high voltage transmission lines, but people don't like high voltage transmission lines going through the middle of their farms or their houses, uh, and so we gave the utilities, private companies, the right to seize that property. The federal government preempted state authority to regulate railroads. Railroads uh, crossed uh, interstate boundaries, and we felt that the railroad was so important uh, to the nation that we didn't want states fiddling with railroads even when railroads were gouging their farmer customers. We allowed interstate banking, and then we encouraged an orgy of mergers, and this is all recent news. Uh, the four largest banks in 2010 were 37 individual banks only 20 years ago. And those 37 individual banks 20 years before that were 200 banks. Uh, and so we created and in fact encouraged uh, larger and larger banks, which as we understand uh, could create a problem. We signed free trade agreements that stripped us of our ability to regulate the flows of capital and goods across our borders because we figured that if another country could produce something more cheaply than we could, for no matter what the reason, we paid less. If we paid less, we had more money in our pocket. If we had more money in our pocket, we would spend it elsewhere and we would all grow faster. And then in the last 40 years, very recently really, since the 1960s, some would say maybe from the 1950s, the dynamic of history abrupt, abruptly changed. And it was driven, that change, by two mutually reinforcing factors. One was technological and one was cultural. In terms of technologies, the new technologies, the new machines, are in their impact centrifugal, not centripetal. They are decentralizing in their impact, not centralizing. They encourage and honor smaller scale rather than larger scale. When we shift, as we are doing now, from concentrated energy sources like fossil fuels back to more diffuse and decent energy sources like solar uh, and wind uh, and slow moving water, we shift from big and centralized to small and dispersed. The internet not only makes all of us customers, but it makes all of us potentially producers in an increasingly information intensive economy. Culturally, we've begun to question the economies of scale. We've begun to, con uh, to uh, question the conventional wisdoms that have underpinned, uh, if you will, the policies that we've developed over the last 150 years. 
we've rediscovered the value of community and we've discovered the dark side of globalization. We've discovered the diseconomies of scale as well as the economies of scale. And all around us, we, we see that sometimes in inchoate uh, areas, sometimes in fragmented areas, but I think it's fairly clear now uh, that the word local and community, or the words local and community, which I think maybe just a few years ago were considered quaint sort of pastoral romantic yearnings for yesteryear, uh, have become in fact much more profound and much more concrete. The local food movement is strong and is growing rapidly. Indeed, it has coined its own new word, locavore. We talk of energy independence, not of nations, but of states and of cities and even of buildings. At my organization, we're thrilled that the term local self-reliance, 36 years after we coined it, is now becoming a matter of the zeitgeist. An excellent indicator of the power of the local in 2010 is the eagerness which with, which with, which with, <laughs> with which the global corporations have tried to change the obvious meaning of the word local. My colleague at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, Stacy Mitchell, has widely written on this subject. And if you're interested in reading her writings and find out what we do in more detail, New Rules, one word, dot org, and you can look at them. Or you could read her writings at the Huffington Post. Ariana Huffington called us up a couple of months ago and asked if we would partner with her on her new campaign, which is called Move Your Money. It has generated an enormous uh, amount of activity uh, nationwide and of interest, and it essentially uh, asks uh, that cities uh, and states and individuals and businesses move their money uh, from big banks uh, and small banks to small banks and community banks, banks that are rooted uh, in your locality. The first column that Stacy did for the Huffington Post on that uh, issue said, well, moving your money to the deposits of local banks is nice, but let's remember that local banks lose money on deposits. Even if they pay you a very small amount, it still is an amount. Um, much better is to move your borrowing uh, to local banks. That's how they make their money. So move your credit cards, uh, move your consumer loans, uh, move your mortgages uh, there. Um, Stacy has written recently about how the word local has now been embraced by the global. She writes, in a spate of new advertisements and PR maneuvers, the nation's largest banks are working hard to win us back. They are in effect standing on our doorstep, flowers in hand, trying to convince us they have changed. They're using words like local and community because they know quite well that there's a rival for our affections. A recent Zogby poll found that nearly one in 10 Americans has already moved at least some of their business to small banks or credit unions. And a number of examples of how the rules can encourage sustainability. The best way uh, to encourage recycling is to discourage the dumping of garbage in landfills. But when states have tried to do this, the Supreme Court has stepped in and said that although we might call it garbage, they would call it commerce. And according to the Constitution, states do not have the right to interfere with interstate commerce. Only Congress has the power to do that. And so when, when uh, New Jersey tried to ban the dumping of Pennsylvania's garbage inside New Jersey, the Supreme Court said, mm -mm -mm, you, you, you can't do that. That's the flow of commerce. Well, Wisconsin said, we got a better idea. Let's redesign that law such that you can dump garbage inside of Wisconsin, but only if the content of that garbage is similar in terms of the recycled content, that is the amount removed because it's recyclable, uh, as the garbage uh, in Wisconsin, which has a mandatory recycling law. And the Supreme Court overturned that law as well. And then came Michigan, which said, I think we can do it even better. I think we can do it in a way that you, can, you, can, you have to support this. It's a fascinating law, passed in the late 1980s. And it was a law that said each county has to be responsible 
for its own solid wastes. It, it had to build a landfill or expand a landfill such that it could cope with 20 years of increased generation of solid waste. And in return for requiring that county to accept the responsibility for its own wastes, it gave it the authority to stop outside garbage from coming into its landfill, either garbage from other counties in Michigan or garbage from other states. Now, it was a, it's a fascinating law in some ways because what that means essentially is that the county has a very substantial incentive to maximize recycling or reuse because the more you recycle, the longer the life of that landfill. But if you can't stop garbage from coming into that landfill from outside, then you essentially uh, have done nothing to help your county uh, overall. And the Supreme Court said no, uh, that uh, Michigan could not, in fact, stop garbage from coming in uh, outside, and the law was essentially overturned. Well, this can be easily remedied, easily remedied. Congress could pass a one-sentence law that says states have the authority to manage their wastes, even if in doing so, they impinge on interstate commerce. Very simple law, although I'm sure that when Congress got through, it would be a 1,500-page law, but nevertheless, it could be a relatively simple law uh, in concept. Uh, there's another uh, obstacle that we need to overcome. Today, when you buy from a local bookstore or a local uh, store of any kind, you'll pay a sales tax in Wisconsin and in virtually every other state in the country. But if you buy from Amazon that same product, you don't have to pay a sales tax. Now, what that means is that right off the bat, that local business... I mean, after all, that local business is trying desperately to compete with huge companies. And now we have, right off the bat, given them a 5 in some cases up to 10% uh, price uh, disadvantage. Uh, uh, when states tried to require companies like Amazon uh, and the like uh, to uh, collect the sales tax uh, and give it uh, to the states, the Supreme Court once again said you can't do that because that's interstate commerce, and there's another complicated aspect of it that I don't need to get into, but in any case, they said, no, you can't do that. But Congress could give you the right to do that, and for the last 25 years, people have been trying to convince Congress to pass the one-sentence law that says that states can tax the sale of interstate goods, and Congress has not done so, and it has not done so in part because of the lobbying of companies like Amazon uh, and others, but in part because those of us who use the internet don't want to pay taxes. We think it's terrific that we can buy for a few percent less someplace else. We don't think about the fact that it might, what it might do to the local economy. It's a little like the free trade argument where you can save a few bucks by importing everything from China. Well, yeah, but if you import everything from China, you're actually producing nothing yourself, and eventually uh, you go under. Uh, and so we need to understand the relationship of our individual behavior to our community behavior, but we need a little help uh, here in terms of changing the rules. Well, what would the rules be like if, in fact, we developed them uh, for sustainability uh, and community? Well, I'm in this area of the country. Uh, and so there's an obvious example, the Green Bay Packers. I don't need to tell you necessarily the history, but I always find it fascinating. Hmm? Green Bay Packers, a little teeny town, has a National Football League team. A little teeny town, right? Well, because when it started, everybody got together and put in 25 bucks, uh, and they had self-franchise. What was it, 1920, 1921? So everybody could buy a little, little share. And then the genius of it came in. Because after all, you got a $25 chair that's just probably worth, I don't know, $50,000 now, I don't know, right? Well, <laughs> you could sell it. I mean, after all, it's your share, you get to sell it. But the money, the appreciation over the $25 would have to go to a fund that would build a war memorial. It was after World War I, after all. Hmm? So it eliminated your individual 
greed incentive, if you will, uh, to sell your share in the Green Bay Packers. And so there you have it, a team which is clearly an embodiment of community, a team that has generated enormous amounts of money, forget about pride, uh, to the local area, all because of a rule that was developed uh, almost 100 uh, years ago. Well, let me give you some other rules. Let me start with a thought experiment. I mentioned that the Clean Air Act was one of the great legacies of the modern environmental uh, movement. Well, the Clean, Clean Air Act had to deal with the problem of pollution caused from smokestacks in factories. And it dealt with it by requiring factories to raise the height of their smokestacks. In fact, there was a term related to this that became very popular in the early 1970s. The solution to pollution is dilution. So what happened when you raised the height of the smokestacks is that you, you converted a problem, which is essentially a particulate matter problem, into an acid rain problem, into a problem that was now regional, and in this part of the country, even uh, international. Well, what if instead, in the Clean Air Act, it had said not that you would have to raise the height of your smokestacks, but you would have to lower the height of your smokestacks curve the end of it so that it came into the window of the boardroom. <laughs> now, at that point, what we have done is marry authority and responsibility. Hmm? And I assure you that the nation's CEOs would have immediately given the order to their industrial engineers that they want zero emissions manufacturing. We wouldn't have had waited 50 years for one or two plants uh, to come up with that uh, idea. Let me give you what's not a thought experiment, but a possibility, another example of rules. Every year, thousands of pieces of property are seized for public purpose. Sometimes the public purposes are good, and sometimes the public purposes are bad. But in each case, we are required by a constitution that the property owner be compensated fairly. Well, what is fairly? Well, fairly means you get the market value of the house, although often you have to fight for it, but nevertheless, fairly means you get the market value of the house. Well, let's say that we're going through a community. Let's say it's a, it's a highway that's going through a community. And in the community, there are two identical homes. In one home, people have lived there for 50 years, or the family has lived there for 50 years. In the other home, People have just moved in as renters, and the house was just sold to an outside investor. From a compensation standpoint, they both will get the same amount of money. But from a value to the community standpoint, they are profoundly different in their impact. So what if we had a law, a compensation law, which would be done at the local level, county level, state level, that said that at a minimum, you get the market value. Everybody gets the market value because that's required by the Constitution. But then for every 10 years that you've lived in that house, you get 10% more or 20% more or 30% more. In other words, we're recognizing in a crude way, but we're quantifying where we can the qualitative value of rootedness in the community, the qualitative value of somebody in that house having an institutional and a neighborhood memory, someone in that house watching the street, someone in that house knowing their neighbors and knowing what goes on uh, in that neighborhood. If we did that, we would raise the price of taking a property. And that would raise the cost of whatever that public purpose was supposed to be. But that just means that we have valued community. Sometimes we might change the cost-benefit ratio to the point where we would abandon the proposed project. For example, a high voltage transmission line or a new uh, interstate uh, highway. Well, here's another example. And it's an example from, uh, from the energy uh, area. And it's an example of how we can, in fact, move towards self-reliance. The Institute for Local Self-Reliance did a study, which is available on our website, that looked at every state in the country and every renewable energy resource that every state in the country had. 
and we looked at the amount of renewable energy that could be generated inside of the state from that renewable resource, and we only looked at those renewable resources which were commercially harvestable. In other words, wind over a certain speed, uh, sunlight on rooftops. Uh, and what we concluded was that 60% that of all of the states in the country, including Wisconsin, could be self-sufficient in renewable electricity. Now, I know what you're saying. Renewable electricity is intermittent, and so you would need storage capacity or some backup natural gas plants, and that's true. But essentially, what we were saying is there's an enormous amount of renewable energy that could be harvested inside of states like Wisconsin. And it would make sense for states to, in fact, emphasize in-state development of renewable energy resources because it marries an environmental objective to an economic development objective. It maximizes dollars that flow through the state economy. It maximizes jobs that are created from that. But only Ohio, only Ohio in the entire country actually requires that part of its renewable energy mandate be met by in-state renewable electricity. Now, Wisconsin has a renewable energy mandate. Minnesota has a renewable energy mandate. Many states have renewable energy mandates right now, over 30 of them. But only one has said it's important for us that a significant amount of this electricity is generated in state. Now, for those of you who might be economists, you will argue to me that this is a very inefficient way to go about uh, creating a market because the winds blow more fiercely in North Dakota than they do in Iowa, in Ohio. And so, therefore, it's cheaper to generate electricity in North Dakota through wind than it is in Ohio. And that's absolutely true. It is. But to get the electricity from North Dakota to Ohio requires you to build a high-voltage transmission line. And when you take into account the costs of that high-voltage transmission line into the cost of electricity, then the cost of generating electricity in Ohio from wind is about the same and even lower than it is generated in North Dakota and transported to Ohio. And moreover, if you build a high voltage transmission line, you have to, there is, as they say in the military, a lot of collateral damage. There may be tens of thousands of homes and businesses uh, that, uh, and, and farms that are taken in the path of that high voltage transmission line from North Dakota uh, to uh, Iowa. Uh, there are people who will lose part or all of their land, and there are, everybody in that path is going to lose a certain amount of the value of their land. Now, in the rush to build high-voltage transmission lines, the Congress of the United States has increasingly given the power to the federal government to force high-voltage transmission lines on states like Wisconsin. So Wisconsin might say, you know, we don't really think we, we want one because all it's going to do is to pass from North Dakota through Minnesota through Wisconsin and end up in Chicago. I mean, this is no benefit to us, and, uh, and it's us that we have to worry about. And what Congress is saying increasingly is, no, no, it's not you you have to worry about. It's the broader us you have to worry about. And we all want renewable. Isn't that a major national goal? Uh, and so, therefore, you are forced to accept a uh, high-voltage transmission line. Well, no. We should say to Congress, let's do it inside of the state until such a point where we exhaust it or until such a point where it's so dramatically different in terms of its economics to take it from another state rather than generate it inside of the state uh, that we are forced uh, to do it. There are other rules related to renewable energy that we need to change. There's a tax incentive. The whole reason we have renewable energy right now is the mandate, which is the major reason, and then the other is the incentives that are given by the federal government. But the incentives that are given for renewable energy right now are incentives that encourage large-scale, absentee-owned systems. The current federal incentives are tax deductions and tax credits, and the value of a tax credit and a tax deduction to you is the amount of tax liability that you have. Many people don't. Forty percent of all Americans don't itemize deductions uh, on their income tax. So for them, it's worth nothing at all. And it's even worse than that, because the wind energy tax credit, for example, can be taken only against what's called passive income. Now, you and I don't earn passive income. Uh, we earn ordinary income, because we're ordinary. Uh, we earn wages. Maybe we'll get some interest from an account. We might get a dividend from a stock. 
All that's ordinary income. But passive income comes from selling goods. It's business income, essentially. And so that's why wind turbines are now almost invariably financed by large corporations, because they profitable large corporations, because they tend to have the tax liability. Well, from a government's perspective, they're going to lose a dollar. They give a dollar of a tax deduction or a tax credit, they're going to lose a dollar. So why not just change the incentive? Don't increase it, just change it. So it becomes a refundable tax credit. So it's available to everybody. Well, what happens then is, from the federal government's perspective, they still lose a dollar, but the dynamic in terms of widespread ownership of wind or solar would be dramatically uh, different. There are changes that we can make in terms of renewable energy, which I think are extremely uh, important. Uh, in, in this area, uh, you have a city utility. Those of you who live here uh, locally, there's a city utility a municipally owned utility. A municipally owned utility is a very interesting vehicle for doing many of the things that we want to do because a municipally owned vehicle, uh, uh, utility, can treat the community as a whole when it does strategic planning. It can, once again, a word that I hate to use, socialize the costs of moving toward renewable energy. Utilities, even municipal utilities, don't like to do that very much, and so what they tend to do is they have a green energy program. I don't know, does yours? I don't know. But in any case, almost all of them do, where they said essentially, if you want to buy green electricity, you can pay two cents more a kilowatt hour, buy 100 kilowatt hours a month, and feel very good about yourself. Well, okay. But I always find it somewhat perverse that those people who want to do a good thing have to pay a, larger, a much higher price than those people who accept doing bad things. That's not a good message to give. So rather than green pricing, what about green citizenship? Which means we, the community, the city as a whole, have decided that we want to maximize renewables. So rather than your having to pay two cents a kilowatt hour more, we will all pay a tenth of a cent a kilowatt hour more. And rather than us ending up having 200 kilowatts or so of wind because there aren't that many people who want to pay two cents a kilowatt more, we got 10 megawatts of wind or 50 megawatts of wind because we're all coming up with the money for it. Green citizenship, uh, not, uh, green, uh, not uh, green consumerism, uh, you know, if, you, uh, if you will. Uh, we need to think about things like this uh, in terms of the new rules for sustainability. And one other thing is that when we talk about sustainable communities, we need to adopt full cost accounting, not partial cost accounting. We need to be able to have accounting systems that allow us to understand the actual cost to the community as a whole as well as individuals. We need to make accounting transparent. Now this is the time of the year, actually last month I believe, the Texas Transportation Institute comes up with its figures for congestion in major cities and major metropolitan areas. And there is then a spate of articles about the billions of dollars we're paying in lost time as a result of being stuck in traffic. Okay. Well look at the data a little more closely. Here we're at a university here. I presume everybody looks at data and doesn't just accept the conclusions that the newspaper tells you, I assume. If you look at the data very closely, what you find is that, in fact, it's true. Commuting time has increased. In the case of the Twin Cities, where I live, it's increased by three minutes each way in the last 20 years. Six minutes. Ah, but they don't tell you that, the Texas Transportation Institute. What they do is they take the six minutes increase for me, then they give a dollar figure of four times the minimum wage, $21 an hour, as the dollar figure for lost time, then they multiply the hundreds and thousands and millions of cars that commute every day by that six minutes, and they come up with a very big figure, which is justified at the legislature for building new roads. It's always at every legislature it's justified for building new roads. Every, you go to your legislature and you find out why it is they want to build a new road. The answer is because congestion is a very serious problem. Well, okay, I get it. But I'm bemused that we don't use the same concept 
of applying a value to a very small amount of time in other aspects of our lives and use that to guide public policy. For example, I am old enough to remember that when you called some business, you got a person on the other side. Last generation, maybe. But in any case, I remember that. 20 years ago, about that time, I moved to the Twin Cities. And, but I would travel a lot, so I would call the Star Tribune to uh, hold the newspaper for a few days. It took me approximately one minute to make that change. Then they got rid of the person, and there was a menu. And there was a menu, and you had to put in what's the hour of the day, what's the day, what's the menu, and so forth. And it took me about not that long, three minutes, three and a half minutes, to make that change. Well, now let's multiply the number of people who go every day and try to use the phone uh, to, and get into a menu, uh, and you get your five minutes or 10 minutes, or there are the horror stories of the half an hour and the hour and the two hours, because people are expensive. Uh, and so what essentially the society has done is impose those costs on you uh, and away from the business. Well, what if we, you know, what if we said, well, you know, maybe we should think of this in the same way we think about roads and time saved. And maybe we should come up with the legislature providing money so people answer the phone. Okay, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Maybe. But a few years ago, the mayor of Boston, Thomas Menino, was infuriated when he tried to call the mayor's office of business services, which was created to help small businesses cut through red tape. He found that it was a test of endurance. He had to put up with convoluted electronic messages and voicemail and so forth. And furious, he instituted a policy the next day that all phone calls to the city would be answered by a person. He said, and I quote, I just think that between 9 and 5 there should be someone answering the phone. We forget the human factor. Hmm. Well, he had to hire people to do that, right? Which means he had to raise taxes. Now, he didn't say that to people. He certainly should have. But he raised taxes in order to have people to answer the phone so that you would, first of all, feel a lot more like a citizen uh, in that government, but also that you would be able to save your time. And the citizens of Boston seem to have accepted that. Last November, six months ago, Menino was elected mayor for an unprecedented fifth term with 60% of the vote. They're beginning to call him mayor for life. Uh, and so we need to begin to think about how we can think of ourselves as individuals, but also think of ourselves as a community. One final example. And this is an example about sustainable communities and equity. Once again, you don't remember, but there was a time when all gas stations had full service pumps. I know, I know, it's, you've got to be very old to understand that, right? Now, of course, almost no gas station has a full service pump, and if they have a full service pump, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg to get the gasoline from that full service pump. There are two states in the country that have said, ah, 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 you will have full service and self-service pumps and you will charge the same price, Oregon and New Jersey. And they did that as a matter of equity, as a matter of civility. They did that because there are old people and there are infirm people who can't in fact pump their own gasoline. Now should they be penalized? Penalized by having to pay 20, 30, 40 cents a gallon more because they can't pump their own gasoline? No, we're all going to pay a little bit more for that gasoline so that we can treat grandpa and grandma uh, and the infirm among us with a certain amount of decency. Now it turns out that Oregon and New Jersey's gasoline prices are actually lower uh, than, the, than, the, uh, than in the states surrounding them. But let's say it wasn't lower. Let's say they were higher. So what? So we need to begin to understand that when we talk about sustainable communities, we are talking about environmentalism, we are talking about energy, we are talking about recycling, we are talking about food production, we are talking about biking, we are talking about walking. But in a larger sense, we are talking about us. We're talking about a sense of community. Now, I've covered a lot of ground this morning, but my central message is that sustainable communities are not only those that lower their carbon footprint. They are communities that have a sense of community 
and a sense of community comes from thinking and acting for the common good. They are a community that tries to maximize community wealth. You know, there's a number of states in this country that call themselves still commonwealths. It's a community that strives to get the most from its local natural capital and financial resources. It's a community that tries to make decisions as transparently as possible. It's a community where the municipal corporation, called your local government, looks beyond its internal balance sheet to the community balance sheet when it makes resource decisions. At every conference, we hear pundits, and we read in the newspapers and on TV, we hear politicians uh, and commentators tell us about how we live in an age of change, great change, dramatic change, and that certainly is true. But we must remember the distinction between change and progress. Bertrand Russell described the difference as well. Change, he said, is inevitable, while progress is problematic. Change is inevitable, whereas progress is ethical. We will have change whether we will it or not, profound change, but we will only have progress if we create the rules that channel human genius in the directions that maximize the common good and build strong local economies and strong, self-confident, and self-reliant communities. Thank you very much.